Dr. Randy Martin with the Marcus Heart Valve Center at Piedmont Atlanta, and I'm thrilled to be joined by Dr. Myra Guerrero. Myra is the Director of Cardiac Structural Interventions at Eviston Hospital, and, and certainly is well known to many of you. Myra, thanks mm -hmm. for joining me. Well, thank you very much for having me. Thank so, you. Myra, the, the, the uh, mitral annual disease, we see a lot of it. Obviously, as, as an echo person, I see it a lot, and we're going to see it increasingly, and it's a challenge to, especially when they have significant mitral stenosis or mitral regurgitation to deal with it surgically sometimes. You've really done a lot of interesting things with transcatheter approach to mitral annular disease. Tell me a little bit about it. Well, as you mentioned, this patient uh, population is a very high risk patient population, Absolutely. even before they present to us with valvular dysfunction. And they have very limited options because they are not good surgical candidates for the um, for many reasons, right. you know, the um, comorbidities that they have and also the technical challenges that the calcium per se uh, poses. So we are um, now uh, discovering that transcatheter mitral valve replacement might be an option in carefully selected patients. So not every single patient is a good candidate. Uh, uh, we are learning uh, thanks to the collaboration of, of the work that we're doing together in the registry. So we have like so far 32 centers already participating in the global transcatheter mitral uh, valve uh, replacement in MAC registry and uh, 11 different countries participating. Cool. So we have data close to like 80 patients and that has been uh, really helpful to try to determine who will do well and who is not going to be a good candidate. Now. Uh, one thing we learn with the registry is, like many other registries, there are limitations. Right. Uh, there are no core labs, so it's super important to have a core lab uh, that for the CT imaging and the echo imaging of this patient. So that led uh, to us to create the mitral trial. So the mitral implantation of transcatheter valves is an FDA-approved ID trial that will hopefully help us have a better uh, idea of who is a good candidate uh, and who is not a good candidate. Is, it, is the mitral trial only for mm -hmm. MAC? Is it for MAC? It's, it's correct. The, okay, so so the common denominator is mitral annular calcification. Okay. Okay. Version one of the protocol was purely focused on mitral stenosis defined okay. by valve area 1.5 okay. or less. Okay. Uh, version two of the protocol is being revised now by the FDA. We are in the final stages of finalizing it. Sure. And uh, we hope to expand that um, to you know other patient populations. Um, I will update the clinicaltrials.gov website as soon as it is approved. It's a little premature for me to say any more. Right, but I uh, all I can say is that we, pl we hope to expand that a little more. Good. In a few days, you'll have an super, update. Super, super. So, Myra, tell me, do, do, what have you learned so far? I mean, and I know that you just gave a, a very intriguing talk on this. Um, what have you learned about people that you can or cannot? Let's talk about people you might not, and I know it's an early, might not w approach with a transcatheter valve because of uh, things that you all have learned. Well, two things. The more important one is um, there is a cohort C in this patient population as well. So we can extrapolate what we learn from TAVR. Right. And when it's futile and when we know that these patients are not going to be better, then it's just better to leave them alone and offer them quality of life as opposed to, to try to offer them and quantity. It, it, and, and I think which is appropriate. Is that based upon mm -hmm. anatomy or Does, and or end stage disease? Uh, well, comorbidities? It's, it's, it's a combination of both, mostly comorbidities. So right. what we learn, what we learned is that they came to us in the registry, many of those patients, they came to us too late. Correct. And um, you know, just to give you an example, when they're intubated on pressors and, and we're doing this just because it's the last thing you can do, um, well, yes, you're trying to offer them something, right. but uh, it's too late. Right. Okay. Uh, we humbly learn, <laughs> it's, yeah. it's, I mean, sometimes no, you cannot but, but offer them. Yeah, and that, I think that's important. Anatomically, have you learned, are there people that you should not? Yes. I mean, tell me, you know, you, you, you just educated us because mm -hmm. I got a chance to listen to you, but what have Thank we learned? You. LVOT obstruction remains to be the main concern. So patients who are at risk of LVOT obstruction should not be approached with a closed transcatheter option. So perhaps if those patients are uh, candidates for the, an open delivery, 
maybe the transatrial delivery under direct visualization and resecting the anterior remove, mitral leaflet. Remove anterior yeah, remo yeah, removing the anterior mitral leaflet, deploy the valve, put a couple of stitches to prevent embolization might be the best option for that subset of patient population if they are good candidates for an open delivery. Right. That's, the, 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 that's why I say the two things, but if they're close to cohort C, uh, not everybody is a candidate for such an invasive delivery. Tell me a little bit more about um, LV outflow tract obstruction. Mm -hmm. How do you judge the, who, who's the worrisome profile mm -hmm. for that? How do you judge that? Well, um, we think that it's a combination of factors. Okay. It's not just the angle, like, uh, you know, everybody talks about the angle. Yeah, the angle is important, but um, it's also the anterior leaflet. The length of the anterior leaflet, how calcified and restricted it is. Uh, the thickness of the septum, the sure. septal bulge. Many of these patients are already, you know, they they're se they have senile hypertrophy of the septum. The uh, size of the LV cavity. Uh, sometimes small cavity. small cavity, small old ladies with right. a small LV. Um, sometimes they do have concomitant aortic stenosis, and the presence of both AS and MS is bad because that makes the LV size even smaller. They have diffuse hypertrophy of the left ventricle, and that combination is also it's also bad. So we think it's a it's multifactorial, and it's putting everything together. It's interesting. In the in years ago, when I was doing my training in the 60s and 70s, we were we would see people who had had uh, Star Edwards valves put in for mitral stenosis with very small ventricles and you got this phenomenon of, of, of valvular entrapment by the ventricle in other words so it's 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 like deja vu so th the patients that look like they're going to be good candidates what are, what's their anatomy look like well uh, diffuse calcium in the annulus uh, more circumferential okay. more circumferential uh, works better the thickness of the calcium, and we have not uh, finalized the CT analysis of, in the registry to tell you exactly how much thickness we're looking for, right. but obviously the, the thicker the better. Uh, continuous uh, calcium as opposed to isolated pieces of okay. calcium. Okay. That's also important. Involvement of the trigons to give you that anterior support because okay. the aortomitral curtain does not give you uh, anterior support. So sometimes if it's not circumferential, but if your trigons are heavily involved, that perhaps can help with, um, with anchoring of the valve. Um, so we talk about LVOT obstruction, and now we're talking about anchoring. So I think if we solve those two, um, then, then we're good. Embolization. Yes. What's the risk for embolization? Well, it's all, it's, it's connected to, to what I to just, just said. What you said. Yeah, That's so a, they do violent. embolize. The difference in pressure between the left atrium and the left ventricle is much higher. So it's different than when we work in, in the aortic uh, uh, position. So the, if they the embolize. Thing, so the, the features you just told me about are the things you look for to prevent mm -hmm. the potential for embolization. Is that correct. correct? Those That's are what the, I was meaning. Yes, those are the features for the patient, but with it also technical. Um, features that we have to consider. So we should not deploy thinking that this is in the aortic position. When we deploy, uh, we know that they embolize to the left atrium right. because of the difference in pressure. So if we deploy just with a standard um, cylindrical shape, then it's going to be easier for those valves to embolize. So we learned that if you flare the valve in the, the LV, the ventricular it, side, it, you flare it. eventually you're hoping that we, you, you have the calcium distribution that we discussed, eventually it will anchor. Okay. So the uh, conical shape or, you know, or flare shape of the valve is very important. The depth of it, mm -hmm. if you are not too concerned about the risk of LVOT obstruction, if you deploy or implant lower in the LV, right. that will give you a little bit of room. You know, if it migrates a little bit, right. yeah, it's, we're not looking for the 50-50 that we were looking in the aortic position. And it might be a little premature to be saying this. I don't know if it's like 60-40, 70-30. Uh, you know, we still are working on that, but the 50-50 is, is not probably not going to be enough. Uh, well, I mean, I think, I mean, it's, it's very, very exciting. I mean, you've done some phenomenal work with this, and I think we're going to be looking forward to seeing this. I mean, these are very difficult patients. I spent a lot of time in the, with surgeons in the operating rooms and at meetings, and, and mitral annular disease is a tough thing. Is a t so having a catheter approach. Uh, final question, obviously now you're doing, the, you're doing them transapically. Is that correct? Well, in the registry, um, uh, there were about 
10% of the patients, 10 to 15% that were uh, treated with an open transatrial delivery. The rest were half and half, transapical or transeptal. Well, okay. Yes, I, I think that if someone is a good candidate for a transeptal delivery, if they have the right anatomy and is uh, in a center where the team has a lot of experience right, with right. a transeptal approach, that should probably be the uh, method of choice because it's less invasive. However, transapical is a lot more friendly for the operator. Right, so it's friendly right. for the operator, but it's not very friendly for the patient, unfortunately. But if someone is in the early experience or the early stage of experience, transapical is easier. Once they develop more confidence and exp experience or expertise, a transeptal, I think, is better for the patient. That's, that's mm -hmm. good. I could ask mm -hmm. you about, um, do you close the, um, the transeptal puncture site and all that stuff? Because, I mean, these people have, if they have MS-like symptomatology, then their LA pressures are high. So that's a whole other question. Listen, you've done some fabulous work with this, and I, I, I really appreciate you spending time with uh, us and educating us, and I look forward to, the, to the, um, some neat things coming out of the module trial. Thank, thank you, you very so much, much for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you for joining us. Thank you.